just want to kick off by thanking you all for joining us for this uh, installment of the Bro Global Health Initiative, um, looking at the global and global health impact of the COVID-19 crisis. As, as I'm sure you know, COVID-19 has surged in South America in recent weeks, leading the WHO to declare it as the new global epicenter of the pandemic. And much like in the US, COVID has also painfully highlighted the significant um, social and political complexities that are exacerbating the problem. So given our many connections to Latin America, both in terms of our work at the Broad and Brodies themselves, and to the many close connections we have in the community um, to the region, it's really an important time to hear firsthand about what's happening there. So speaking of the, the close connections that we have, I'm gonna hand over to um, my uh, colleague and co-host, here, uh, Rafael Sanchez, to, uh, to welcome you on behalf of the Latinx community at the road. Hey, Bronwyn. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rafael Sanchez. Um, Latinx at Broad is a subgroup of the Shades of Broad Affinity Group at the Broad Institute. Uh, the mission of Shades of Broad is to advocate for and support the recruitment, development, and success of ethnic minorities at the Broad. Sharing this mission, Latinx at Broad seeks to build community among Latinx employees and affiliates, promote our rich cultures, and provide education on research done by Latinx scientists or impacting the Latinx community. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, worldwide, Brazil follows the U.S. as a country with the most confirmed cases of COVID-19. Within South America, the number of confirmed cases in Brazil is followed by Colombia, with both countries having an upward trend of daily cases. As a pandemic is becoming more controlled in many parts of the world, Latin American country outbreaks are spiking with little to no media coverage or government support. According to an article in the New York Times, in Latin America, the pandemic has been worsened by underfunded hospitals, lean support systems, and struggling economies with far fewer resources than in Europe or the United States. I'm originally from Venezuela, and many of my Latin Latinx at Broad colleagues and their families also call a Latin American country their home. We are very excited to join forces with the Global Health Initiative on today's Coffee Talk, and we look forward to learning perspectives on the COVID-19 crisis in Brazil and Colombia from our guest specialists. Great, thank you. So uh, just before we hand over to our um, wonderful uh, panel panelists that we have this afternoon, I just wanted to take a quick moment to orient any of you who aren't quite familiar with the geography of the region, um, just a, a bird's eye view of South America to bring to your attention um, where Colombia and Brazil sit um, on the continent. So, so Colombia is, Columbia is, is in the, uh, the northwest um, kind of corner of, of South America um, and is bordered, um, shares a significant land border with, with Venezuela, um, which I think factors significantly into the COVID uh, uh, crisis there. And also um, shares a border with Brazil through the Amazon region, which, which I know is another significant part of the story in both Brazil and Colombia. So with that, I'm, uh, it's just a great pleasure to welcome our, our speakers. They are um, friends and collaborators of the Global Health um, Initiative and the uh, Infectious Disease, Disease and Microbiome Program at the Broad. Uh, Dr. Fernando Boza is a clinical um, uh, uh, care doctor, critical care doctor, and, and research scientist um, based at the Field Cruz Institute um, in Rio with a long history of working on multiple infectious diseases in the country. Um, Dr. Marcia Castro um, is, is based in Boston, just across the river from the Broad um, at the Harvard School of Public Health where she um, does tremendous work on, uh, on, on malaria, um, looking at the epidemiology and, and demographics and was also uh, deeply involved in the Zika um, epidemic that, uh, that uh, was centered in Brazil a few years ago and is of course a Brazilian national herself and continues to work closely in the country. 
And then moving over to Colombia, we're so proud to welcome Dr. Socrates Herrera, um, who, who's a world-renowned malariologist um, and leads his own institute in, in Cali. Um, historically focused on malaria, um, but uh, as many research institutes have, in, including the Broad, has really pivoted a lot of attention um, to, to supporting the COVID response in his country. So without further ado, we're going to hand over now to, to the speakers to tell you more about um, their work and their experience and what they're seeing really on the ground um, in, in their home countries and, and, and uh, what we can learn from their insights uh, about the work happening in Brazil and Colombia and how it relates to things we're facing at home in the US. So uh, let's hand over to Fernando first here. Um, oh, just a few quick notes actually before we move on, just to, to mention that the session is being recorded. Um, please submit any questions. We hope to have some time for a great Q&A um, session with the audience. Um, we'd love to see your questions come in in real time so we can queue them up. Um, and if your question is selected, we are going to try our best to, to find you and unmute you so that you can ask your questions directly to the speakers. Um, uh, so just look out for that if you've asked a question, we'll, we'll try our best to make that work. Fernando, let's uh, head over to you and if you, if you are, let me see, where's the stop share, there we go. If, uh, if you're happy to, to take it away. Okay, uh, thank you, it's a really a great pleasure to, to take part of this panel and especially to talk about uh, some data that usually we're not looking. And my, I prepared some, some slides just to introduce the, the, the subject and I use the, this idea of an invisible outbreak and especially to explore what this uh, common data are not showing about the, the iniquity in Brazilian COVID-19 response. And usually, I, I, I'm sure all, all are looking this kind of data coming, for example, from our, our uh, world in data, uh, where we have this uh, cumulative confirmed cases from the US, from Brazil, from European countries, and also uh, deaths and, and coming from uh, the same place. However, uh, probably this, this data not express completely the, all the complexity uh, of this outbreak, and especially uh, the pandemic, uh, especially for some vulnerable populations. And, and when uh, I, 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 I picked some a special key event that occur, occurred in Brazil uh, after the beginning of pandemic. And we, we can uh, first identify early response coming from some states, really early at the beginning of the outbreak. And, but after, what, uh, especially from the, the central government, uh, we we identify really a misconduction of the, the outbreak. And uh, after two months, uh, the, the president fired the Minister of Health and invite a second Minister of Health that uh, resigned uh, one month, less than one month. And, and now we are starting to open or reopen uh, the, for example, malls in Rio and Sao Paulo, the major cities, is still with a, a large outbreak ongoing. And for other side, we have several difference uh, when we look distribution uh, and lethality around the country. And, and we can see in this map, for example, the north part of the country this is the Amazonic area of Brazil uh, with uh, uh, many confirmed cases and also a lot of deaths. And, and recently in the national uh, seroprevalence study, we can identify uh, from the, the, the 10 uh, uh, higher uh, seroprevalence in 90 cities around the country, nine cities are in the north part of the country. 
And, and this is a little bit small view about the Amazonic situation. And we can identify many caves and that's close to the rivers, close to the, the Amazon River. This is the imaging of new uh, cemeteries in Manaus. And also this kind of uh, 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 collective funerals occurring. And, but uh, one important point is that much of the transportation in this region is done by boat. And this is the view of a boat that usually takes uh, one day or two days uh, around to go from um, Manaus, for example, to, to other cities uh, uh, in close or uh, uh, in the, still in the state of Amazonas or Pará. But, and, and this is in the other map, uh, what I'm showing is in red, the access to, to beds, especially to ICU beds. In, in red is regions without ICU beds. And, and this is a little bit of this view about the Amazon. But also what, what is really a, a major issue is that this, also this outbreak is arrive, arriving far, even in the forest for isolated populations. And a very complex communication and how uh, to manage this outbreak in this population, especially in a moment where we have invasion in areas, uh, for example, the Yanomami era is invaded what more than 20,000 Garimperos uh, that, uh, that are using this momentum that were uh, uh, where the, the, the native population is inside the forest to occupy this territory. Uh, other uh, aspect is how are the, the socioeconomic determinants of lethality also in the country? We look at a large, a large data bank of, uh, uh, of uh, Brazilian uh, influenza surveillance with a final sample of more than than 54,000 cases of COVID-19. And we identify clearly using uh, multivariable analysis, even uh, with uh, adjustment for race, educational level, region, age, uh, gender, and comorbidities, that this increase uh, lethality, especially in, in mixed and black population, in, 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 in people, especially the illiterate and elementary school population, and also especially in the north and northeast part of the country. Also, this is an uh, applet that our group developed to test, track, and trace, uh, like other, other initiatives around the world. And we are testing uh, 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 people in Rio de Janeiro, and for example, when when we look, this is the the symptoms uh, in in Rio area. Uh, we can see that in rich area, it's green, very low risk, and in in red, this is the periphery of the city with a lot of symptomatic people, and also. When we compare the seroprevalence inside the same city, we have uh, people in the more rich area with 5% of seroprevalence, and in some favelas, for example, 35% of seroprevalence. This is a, a brief introduction and to, to start this, this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Yeah, that's a perfect, uh, perfect way to kick off. And let's hand over to um, Dr. Marcia Castro for uh, further perspective um, from Brazil, um, from her work and experience there. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for organizing this discussion. I think we need more events when we talk about other places other than the US. So uh, pleasure to be part of this, this panel. So um, I'm not going to use slides. I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a very brief condensed overview of, of different issues. Um, some overlap with what Fernando just said, but 
The first thing I want to say is that Brazil could have provided a lesson to the world on how to respond to a pandemic using its universal health system um, and one of the largest networks of community-based primary care in the world. It could have learned from the mistakes and uh, successes from other countries. It had the time for that. Um, and above all, it could have built on its own history of responding to new health threats like Zika uh, and HIV AIDS. However, what we see is very different, um, as Fernando showed. So let me raise two issues um, that contribute to the current scenario we see in Brazil. So first of all, Brazil has a leadership that downplayed the importance of the virus, is against any form of social distancing on the grounds of preventing economic loss, ignores scientific evidence. So this brings challenges to mayors and governors uh, who try to adopt responses that are not really favored by the leadership, by the president, and suffer pressure from business groups that are concerned with financial losses. It also makes it almost impossible to achieve full compliance um, of the population to those measures as supporters of the president concur with his message. In the absence of strong leadership, uh, we see many local responses given by um, combinations of public-private partnerships, community groups, NGOs, um, um, and government pairing with uh, community organizations. Those responses come in the form of provision of food, protective equipment, healthcare uh, to poor communities, and repurposing industry to produce needed equipment, such as ventilators. The second thing is that by not leveraging its health system, the country failed to guide local health officials on how to engage community health workers to conduct active search of vulnerable individuals, for example, and above all, to, contact, uh, to perform contact tracing. Most importantly, it failed to provide a locally adapted response, one that addresses inequalities which are extremely high in Brazil. It's impossible to imagine that, for example, social distancing strategies that just like the way they worked in Europe, that they're going to work in Brazil without being locally adapted to levels of informal labor, poor housing, no access to water, or low supply of physicians and hospital beds in some localities. Uh, in the middle of a pandemic, one would expect that the Ministry of Health would be one of the most important governmental institutions in the country. Yet, as Fernando just mentioned, in less than a month, one minister was fired, another one resigned, and after more than a month since that happened, the Ministry of Health remains ministerless. It has been led by an interim minister, an army general, who may know a lot about logistics but knows nothing about health. The consequences of this chaos are reflected in COVID statistics. Brazil is now second country in cases and deaths in the world. Um, it's a matter of days. We're going to hit a million cases. Uh, we're almost there. I think we are at nine, 955,000 or so. Um, and truth be told, Brazil is the main reason why Latin America is now the epicenter of the pandemic. The statistics explain the inequalities in the country. The majority of cities with highest uh, COVID-related incidents and mortality rates are in the Amazon region, as you saw in the maps that Fernando showed. And many face a shortage of hospital beds and ICU beds. Uh, if you look at standardized mortality rates, they are proportionally higher among vulnerable, vulnerable groups living in areas with precarious infrastructure. Managing COVID-19 will be a long-term process, and it demands an alignment between the president, the Minister of Health, and local leaders around a uniform and scientifically-based message. Fail to do so, and I would argue we still have time for that, but we can discuss that later, um, will put Brazil on a path that results in the unnecessary loss of many lives and the exacerbation of already large social, economic, and regional inequalities. Thanks, Marcia. Um, yeah, that uh, 
together those give a really uh, a great insight into the just the sheer complexity of the of the issues facing Brazil now and so many elements that you touched on I think resonate um, with the experience in the US which I'd love to come back to um, although clearly there's some unique challenges in the Brazilian context but let's move on and hear from Dr. Socrates Herrera first for perspective from Colombia um, and then we'll open it up to a few questions thank you uh, Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you here and with the audience. Uh, um, I think it was a good introduction to have the situation of uh, Brazil in front. And uh, what I want to, to share with you is what we have been uh, dealing with for the last three months here in Colombia. The first uh, few cases uh, were reported by mid-March. Um, and immediately after the government, both the, the regional and the, and the, and the local, the national government decided to close up the, 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 the country and to uh, subject the entire population to quarantine. And here is what we have three months later, uh, uh, as you could see here, and I'm, I'm already uh, Bronwyn mentioned, Colombia is located in the corner of, of South America. Uh, connected with Panama and, and, and therefore to Central America with a long border with Venezuela, but uh, no less uh, important with Brazil, Peru and Ecuador. Um, you can see here from the, from the map, the most, uh, uh, the highest number of cases have occurred in, in Bogota. Um, Colombia is a country with a population of 45 to 50 million uh, habitants and Bogota is between eight and ten million habitants. Border with Venezuela, uh, border with Brazil, Peru, and Ecuador. Uh, uh, we uh, the first few cases were reported three months ago uh, in neighborhood of Cali. I am located in Cali. Cali is here. I don't know if the arrow is indicating in the screen, but Bogota, which is in the middle of the country, has a population of eight to ten million inhabitants and is the, 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 the city with the highest number of cases. But not less important is the Caribbean coast, where the main cities are, are, are presenting a, a significant incidence. Also, uh, our region, Cali, which is located in the state of Valle del Cauca, and close to, 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 to Cali, in one of the, of the provinces close to Cali, on the border of the Pacific coast is Buenaventura. And this is uh, presenting currently the highest incidence. As you could see, both the Atlantic and the Pacific coast are having a, a big burden of, of COVID cases. But also, as you could see down in the, in the bottom of the map, uh, there is Leticia. Leticia is a, it's a, it's a, it's a small town, this is in border, sharing, uh, sharing uh, the border with Peru and, and, uh, and Brazil, and it is located on, on the Amazon River. Uh, both the, 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 the Caribbean and the Pacific, together with, with, with uh, Leticia, are having among the highest incidences of, of, of COVID in, in the country. Uh, as you can see here, the, the incidence of Colombia, as compared to Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil, is, has been relatively controlled. And that has been because immediately after the appearance of the first few cases, with the, with the quarantine we were subjected to, uh, there, was, uh, there was a quarantine for at least two and a half months and uh, a strict uh, uh, quarantine. And only in the last, say, three to four weeks, the government has decided to start opening the economy again. And obviously the cases have started increasing. Uh, we didn't have the situation of a big spike, a big uh, curve in the beginning of the, of the epidemic here, uh, uh, but the cases have maintained relatively control during, the, during the, the, the progress of these three months. This is a situation, as you know, with this long border with, with, with Venezuela, we have about uh, 1.8 to 2 million uh, immigrants from Venezuela, uh, the, we don't have good data from Venezuela, neither from, uh, from the border with Venezuela, but we know that from the 1.8 million people during the pandemic, uh, uh, at least uh, 100,000 people have tried to, to go back to Venezuela. And, uh, and uh, as far as the statistics are indicating, 
we have uh, we have had ab about seven to eight hundred cases reported as cases in Venezuelan people. We don't know exactly at this point if those are cases of Venezuelans that are already installed uh, in a sort of definitive way in Colombia, or if they are immigrants that have been illegally uh, in, in Colombia. In any case, the health system in Colombia is taking care of all cases, including any, any, any immigrant, independently of the legal uh, status of, 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 the, of, the, of the immigrants. So this is compared to the rest of the region. I think that we have been uh, relatively protected uh, because of the, of the quarantine. However, obviously, after three months of 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 of, uh, of, of lockdown, I think that is, I mean, the economy is suffering a lot. A lot of uh, uh, violence, uh, family violence, has been evidenced, and and, and 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 the government decided to start reopening the economy uh, little by little during the last three weeks. Obviously, cases started increasing. Uh, the incident currently is, as I mentioned already, about 109 per, per 100,000 uh, uh, cases. In the beginning, we had a, a big problem that I think that all, all countries in Latin America have, have, have experienced, and it was the, 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 the lack of preparedness to, to diagnose the cases. And, uh, and after uh, getting the training in the facilities, then the restriction in reagents and 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 and, uh, and uh, I mean all the materials for the, for the test. At this moment, Colombia has uh, 76 laboratories. Approximately 70 percent of them in the capitals, in the five main cities. What makes that the, there are many many underserved regions of the country. Uh, uh, fortunately, those other regions are uh, more or less rural, and and then uh, most of the cases are located in the big capital, as you would imagine. The capacity of Colombia is already good enough, I would say. We have the capacity to do approximately 18,000 tests per day. However, because of, of, of economic problems and mainly because of the, of the health system, uh, which is uh, significantly in the hands of private companies, uh, are not demanding, are not requesting, and are not paying for the test. So we have, uh, uh, we have uh, made about uh, half a million tests over the three months, but this corresponds to only one third of the capacity and, and, and maybe 10 per 20 percent of the of the ideal number of of, the, of, of tests that would you would like to, to have. This is, as I mentioned before, uh, due to the limited access to reagents in the equipment in the beginning. Now this is a problem that is relatively solved. Uh, but mainly because of the of the not they are not the, the the health the private health insurance companies are not ordering the tests for people that that are developing symptoms and 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 again um, besides that there is a problem for for the payment of of those of those tests. But El Cauca, as you as you saw, uh, the region where Cali is located, reacted immediately after the initiation of the pandemics in, in, in Colombia and created what it is called here COPESA, which is a public-private health experts committee where we established uh, a number of subcommittees. Uh, the one was to ensure the, the hospital capacity for the region. Second, to create a, a group of experts in public health, epidemiology, and research. Uh, third, to another one to ensure the biosafety for the health personnel. Another one, uh, a grouping all the uh, health and, and medicine uh, schools from the region. There is a, a total of 12 uh, schools of medicine uh, united into an alliance that is providing training both to, 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 to health personnel and to, and to the community. And, uh, and very importantly, uh, a, a very large and robust group of, of psychologists and psychiatrists uh, providing uh, mental health. There is, a, uh, uh, there is a, a very good effort in trying to maintain the, 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 the mental health in the, com in the population, both uh, those uh, participating in, in, in health attendance and, and the, the population as, as a whole. 
uh, all these uh, different subcommittees are very highly influenced or coordinated by, by, by the Secretary of, of Technologies of Information and Communication. We created a platform that is providing a, 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 that is providing a support to all the rest of the committees and is especially covering the full region of the Pacific Coast. I think that this is an example in the country of a city, a main city that is providing support to four other regions in the Pacific Coast that, that, that I already mentioned, that there was a, a big uh, uh, incidence uh, in Buenaventura and in Tobacco in the border of, with, with Ecuador. And these have been supported by this type of facility where you have uh, access to, uh, on real time, to the, no the cases and the mobility of the cases uh, and the contacts of the people. So we have been working together with this, with this a uh, big alliance of, of, of where, where uh, are participating the government, the NGOs, uh, uh, all the universities in the region, and, and lots of uh, private and public volunteer people to, to attend the pandemics. It has had influence, a tremendous influence in, 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 in the research and other type of projects in other diseases like dengue and malaria. And something that is very sad is that the mortality by, by dengue has, has increased in the last a uh, few months, as you could see here from this graph, in, in, uh, it is representing in, in blue the incidence or the prevalence in, in, in March, April, May, and June of that year for dengue, that it, because it's urban, is having much more uh, uh, in, increase in, in the last few months and the mortality. And in the case of malaria, you would believe that this is going down, but this is a problem of under uh, registration because Obviously, because malaria is in rural and isolated areas, then uh, we are we know that there are there are big peaks of of, of 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 morbidity and mortality in those regions, particularly in the Pacific Coast that I already mentioned. But they don't have access to diagnosis and they don't have access to treatment. So this is not only the problem of COVID here, but it's also influencing tremendously other diseases. I'm just giving the example of what is happening in dengue and malaria, where uh, one of the, our main uh, 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 projects that, as mentioned by Bowie, uh, uh, it has been basically stopped, arrested significantly because of the impossibility of going to these endemic regions and providing them diagnosis and, and, and services. I think that I will leave it there and, and I will be uh, happy to, to answer uh, any questions around that. Thank you, Socrates. Can you just uh, stop sharing your screen? Maybe. And uh, so just a reminder, first of all, thank you so much to all of the speakers for sharing uh, some perspective from your countries. Um, it's already been illuminating. I want to remind the audience now to, to chime in with questions. I certainly have a few, but we'd love to hear from all of you. If you do submit a question, please let us know um, where your where you're tuning in from, whether it's a local institution in Boston or the Broad, obviously, or, or if you're joining us um, from maybe somewhere in Brazil or Colombia, please let us know. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you a few questions while we wait for some to come in from the audience. First of all, I, I think um, I just love to hear from, from each of you what your personal role has been. Um, none of you, I think, six months ago would have called yourself a, a, a a COVID-19 expert, but I'm, I think in, in, your, uh, in each of your uh, own ways, um, you are becoming amongst the experts on the continent and we'd just love to hear what you're doing in terms of clinical work, public health, public policy and, and research work. Um, maybe we'll start with Fernando and just move through. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's a hard question because finally uh, our group was doing different things in this moment and and especially we have uh, a part of the group in the lab working with the more basic science and also antiviral uh, response and and especially uh, we run a larger network of uh, clinical research in, in critical care and especially in this case we are we are running a large uh, initiative together with colleagues uh, of uh, ISARIC, for example, collecting data uh, from hospitalized 
patients in Brazil, but also clinical trials and 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 more um, translational translational uh, research. But also part of our group and family, uh, the the people that usually works with uh, uh, data science moved to to look better the data and try to to have also better data. Great, thanks. And Marcia? Yeah, so I am part of a large uh, group of researchers based in Sao Paulo um, who are basically cracking data every single day and trying to support um, municipal and state health secretariats. Initially it was in Sao Paulo, but now it's uh, many different ones all over Brazil. Um, I have collaborations um, with the Ministry of Health um, in the surveillance department. And again, we're analyzing lots of data. Um, and I have collaborations in the Northeast um, in looking particularly at uh, COVID and pregnant women and children, child development. So uh, that's a group that is not being studied a lot. We don't quite fully understand what are the impacts during pregnancy and for young children. Um, so we are doing some work on that. Um, with a, a former Takemi fellow who is actually from Fio Cruz, who works with Fernando uh, in Rio, we are uh, putting together a proposal to try to look at um, how immunity builds up, if it does, over time. Um, and I hope we can move forward with that. And I've been doing a lot of public engagement mm -hmm. because I think it's something we have to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, crazy information been around so it takes a lot of time but every opportunity I have in a serious venue to actually be able to talk about science and, and the truth I <laughs> take it it's a lot of work but I think it's it's something we all have to do at this time excellent and Socrates yeah um, well okay what, what happened here is that that immediately after the initiation of the of the of the and then the report of the first few cases in Colombia, the, as, as I mentioned, the governor organized this committee and I was invited to coordinate that committee. And that brought me a, a significant amount of work, uh, not being an expert on, on, on virology and not being an expert as none of, of, of us is on, on COVID. <laughs> But uh, uh, some of the things that I had done in the past, for example, being a, a professor at the university for more than 50 years, allow me to organize rapidly uh, all the schools of health to start giving uh, 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 education to, to the health uh, workers. And we established rapidly a diploma a course that is, is formal course. Uh, we have had a, a first cohort of 8,000 people already graduated from that and a second round going on and through that inviting and trying to cover the Pacific Coast region as I mentioned before uh, in terms of education and education is something that is is is, is significantly important in because it's covering from a uh, from the very low level of, of, of education for people in the communities to training the intensivists and, and people in, in experts in, in infectious diseases. Nobody was knowledgeable about that. And then I think that, that this is something that is, is doing very well. Second thing I, we, is, is, is doing this, this, this committee is ensuring the capacity of the hospitals to, to have enough intensive care units, to have enough uh, uh, biosafety material for the, for the health uh, 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 people. Uh, the other thing we have been doing, obviously, is working very hard in trying to, to, to provide enough diagnostics. Um, and among the group of epidemiologists and infectologists that we organize in, in this committee, I have been helping significantly in a number of, of studies, I mean, research that has been organized in terms of epidemiology, uh, public health, immunology. We are also doing a, a, a test on try, a, a, a study trying to understand uh, the immune response in the different categories of, of clinical presentation of, of the disease, what happened with those. We are 
uh, uh, close to, to death in the intensive care units as compared to the significant number of asymptomatics, what is different among them. So this is a project that is going on. And, and, and basically this has been what was important here. I mean, I think the more, more important from the point of view of, of us as a, as a research group is that because we were anyway forced to be in quarantine, then we decided to provide the facilities of the center and the human capacity of the, of the, of the institute to offer uh, more diagnosis. So we have been working closely with the, with the local government. They provide the materials and the reagents and we provide the capacity, the human capacity and the equipment. And we are obviously in, uh, 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 strengthening the capacity of the government to provide more diagnosis. So in this moment, we are very, very much focused on the most underserved region of, of the Pacific coast of Colombia, mm -hmm. because we, uh, by obviously by because of the social status of those communities, but also uh, potentially because of any reasons and, and genetics, uh, there are significantly more COVID in the in the in the Afro-Colombian uh, descendants and mm -hmm. in the in the indigenous communities. So we are trying to provide support to those on the surf regions. Wow, great work. And uh, certainly parallels, as I mentioned, to uh, the, the work at the Broad to pivot our uh, resources for testing in this region, too. So uh, thank you all for the important work you're doing. I, uh, we're going to hand over to audience questions in just a moment. I just wanted to take take the chance to touch on um, on the issue. I mean, you, you've all spoken to it, but um, the issue of, of health disparities, um, racial and economic, um, and, and I think we can all see that, you know, in, in, in the U.S., in, in, in the Boston area, and, and in your countries, this is very much a disease of inequality, um, and would love to hear more from your perspectives of how that's playing out in Brazil and Colombia, and what has really been the response of the people, you know, in the in the U.S. driven by, by obviously many factors. Um, there's just a lot of attention on 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 on, on racial uh, racial health disparities um, at the moment, and we're hearing a lot kind of from the people um, asking for for better. Um, and is that are you know is there similar factors and similar responses from the public playing out in uh, in Brazil and Colombia? How does that look? So I can start. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, um, I mean, Br Brazil is marked by really heavy social and economic inequalities. And, and just to give one example, because we highlighted in the Amazon, um, it's about 43% of the population in the Amazon don't have access to water. So they cannot exercise the very first recommendation, wash your hands for 20 seconds with water and soap. So, but despite the inequalities, um, the, the way to go is then to have your responses um, that, you know, recognize those inequalities and target those inequalities so then um, you can address them. Um, now, in the case of Brazil, the way to do this is to use, um, the health system is to use the community health agents. It's to use those folks that are right there in the community. They know where those problems are. And again, Brazil had time to prepare for this. <laughs> so what did Brazil do? They just ignore the health system. They ignore the primary care. And they just say, okay, from starting tomorrow, everybody has to stay home. It's not going to work. So uh, Brazil is this contrast of what it could have been and what it is, and it makes all of us, Brazilians or not, highly frustrated because the gap is so big mm -hmm. and we are basically measuring this gap in human lives. Mm -hmm. But so potentially we could have addressed those inequalities. They're there. They're huge. They are across municipalities and you take any big city. Um, and, and Fernando showed the map of Rio. Um, I grew up in Rio, maybe he did as well. So it's highly unequal. So there's no way you can say, this is gonna be the response and it's gonna be the same across the city. It can't be. But we didn't have from the government that response. We had from the community. So you look at the, the slums in, in Rio, they have organizations, they created their own websites to register cases and deaths. They have their own apps. They're basically being this, in the absence of the state, they're being the state. So you have all those, those governances going on to replace the absence of the state. It's been phenomenal. 
it's a mix of philanthropy, it's a mix of community leaders, and it's really beautiful. But the point is, as beautiful as this is, this should be on top of a governmental response. Mm -hmm. And then it would be even prettier, right? <laughs> but it can't be the sole response, right. and that is the problem. Fernando, anything to add? I'm sure you do. Um, yeah, I agree completely with Marcia, and uh, just to add that uh, probably the, the best way was to really use the system, and especially the, the social engagement, with some lab capacity and to connect with uh, new technologies, especially for active surveillance in the, in the field, and, and also to connect that to uh, social support and also to, to mechanism of isolation that is really very complex to, to be done in some communities, but that not cost so much to organize that. Then, uh, of course, the, the, the social action uh, is an important piece of this the disposal, but also, uh, of course, also the coordination by the government is necessary. Mm -hmm. The society is very complex to, to organize in the middle of pandemic, uh, for example, uh, a testing program by yourself <laughs> is almost uh, impossible. Mm -hmm. Right. Socrates from Colombia, what are you seeing? Oh, I don't think we can hear you. Hello. Oh, there you are. Yeah, thank there you. There you are. Okay. I think that the, 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 the health system in Colombia uh, is, uh, is, is paradoxical somehow. I mean, we have gained in the last two decades a significant increase in coverage. I think that we are about 100% coverage with the health system. Uh, every, almost everybody has access to, to, to health. However, uh, uh, what we can observe in this epidemic is that, that we have, uh, I mean, a number of, uh, all the regions where we are having the highest incidences, regions where we have a very, very limited uh, uh, health capacity. And this is the Pacific Coast. This is Leticia in the border with, with, with in the Amazon region. This is this is Tumaco in the border with with, with Ecuador, and then uh, uh, this instability in other countries is influencing significantly what is can be observed in other regions. And also, as mentioned for Brazil, there is a big differences between the different regions. Mm -hmm. You could have, uh, uh, for example, places like like Cali and Valle, the region where we are with. The, among the highest uh, uh, incidences and regions like Medellin with the lowest ones in the country. And this is cultural. Uh, uh, a few days ago, uh, because uh, of the holidays and so on, and, and the problems with uh, family violence and so on, uh, the mayor of Cali decided to, to comment that he was considering the possibility in the reopening of opening bars and discos and so on and so forth. Immediately people went to the street and started drinking thinking and dancing, and, and obviously the, the, the incidence of cases went up. So the problem in Colombia at this moment, and what is going to happen in the next few weeks and months, is that because of the reopening, as, as the government has not the capacity to, to control the, the reopening, I mean, the, the government could theoretically think in, in reopening 10% of the activities, economical activities, but this 10% doesn't mean that 10% of the population is going to the street. Behind the 10% of the population that are released to go to the street, there are possibly 30, 40% more. So, and those people going to the street with, because the, 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 the quarantine is being relaxed are those who are not under control. The, the people going to constructions and to the other sectors of the economy are under very strict control. But all the, the, the guys that are going behind all the informal economy, all the people going to the to the traffic lights to sell cigarettes or, 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 or candies and things like that, are extremely exposed. They are not following any rules. They are not social distancing. There is nothing. So we are. Uh, 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 if we did it, did it say it, it, we had a, 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 a good behavior and a good a, a good behavior of the court in the beginning is not 
completely sure that we are going to continue that way because we have now many, many more cases that expose to which the people uh, uh, non-immune are going to be exposed to. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to uh, hand over now to my, uh, my co-host, Rafael, um, who's going to ask uh, some questions on behalf of the, the audience. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for sending your questions. And over to you, Rafael. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, so there is a question from the audience, specifically for Marcia uh, from Cut the Rough. What forms of public engagement are the most effective co to combat misinformation and fake news? And I would add, uh, from a qualitative, a qualitative point of view, what has been the general reaction to the disease? Are populations in these countries skeptical or are they taking the disease seriously and uh, disease and public health recommendations seriously? So let me start by the second question um it depends because you we still have people that support the president and those people go to the streets and they gather they don't use masks and they you know are basically chanting horrible things holding messages that the virus is not dangerous whatever um i hope they're the minority i i don't know i hope period i stop right there but uh, it's happening all over the country um now what is the most um, effective? Um, look, I think we have many different ways of trying to address this. I don't know what's the most effective, but at this point we have to try them all and hope that at least some of them will have um, an impact. Um, we have several uh, people in Brazil now that uh, there's one that is probably the most famous guy. He's, he's a biologist and he basically decided to take all the most complicated information from science and digest it in a way that anybody can understand. Um, and he runs uh, lives on YouTube and, and like more than a million people watch that. Somehow this guy found me and, and I did a live and it was really popular and then I've been doing a bunch of stuff only with serious people some of them I don't even reply because when I check I don't think that's gonna make any difference so that's one uh, the other one is um, I've, I've wrote uh, op-eds um, and I try to talk to media that has a lot of audience because everybody reads that um, you know, I get some crazy comments on Twitter, which I never reply, but that gives you an idea of what is what is the mentality of people out there. Um, and I think it's important to know what's going on. So next time when you talk to, you know, a broad audience, and I, I think the attack is the best defense. So I address that immediately and try to respond. So um, I've been doing many different ones um, and I don't know how is that working. One that I think is very important is I've done a lot of um, large lectures for universities, particularly in the North and Northeast. And those are the, you know, the folks that are entering uh, college. And I think that's a good time to just throw the truth right at their faces and I have absolutely no shame of, uh, you know, speaking tough. So I've been doing that a lot because I think that's important right from the beginning so people understand how to differentiate the right and the wrong. Um, now, which, which of those are the most effective? I have no idea. I don't even know how we measure that because the movement of fake news is really strong. It's growing and this is everywhere. It's not just in Brazil and it's not just with the pandemic, right? Elections are coming, wait and see what's gonna happen. So, but we gotta try and we gotta try to find different ways of doing that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying and, and hopefully some of this is gonna work. Uh, thank you, Marcia. Uh, the next question is going to be, uh, so, so we have Andres Fuluri and Catherine Figueroa asked a similar question, uh, I'm gonna compile them both. What is the level of collaboration between countries in Latin America and COVID response? Is there any support being extended among countries? I don't think a lot of countries wanna work with Brazil. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, this is all about politics. Let me say one thing. Um, academic institutions, yes. I've never seen collaborations between researchers, academic institutions and universities I'm seeing now. I mean, here in Boston, the best example is all hospitals are working together. This never happened before. So 
this is phenomenal. But at a governmental level, if that was the question, uh, you know, then then we reach politics, and I don't think a lot of people are trying to. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. Socrates, what do you think? <laughs> no, I think that the, that the governments in, in, in the region are so busy with internal problems that I don't see, I have to see how could they collaborate with other co countries. I mean, they are, if I look at the, at the Ministry of Health here, he is so much embarrassed, uh, flying all the time, jumping from here to there, trying to solve the situation, that is hard to imagine that he could easily, I mean, interact with anybody. I mean, we, we see a government very committed, very, uh, uh, the the president, the ministers, uh, everybody is very committed. I don't think that we have anything against uh, the government for the internal situation, but I don't see how could Colombia help any any neighbor in this in the current situation. Maybe it is, as, as you said, Marcia. I think that, that 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 from the point of view of research, I mean the the academic is completely different. Uh, uh, I think that we have things to offer and things to receive and it's significantly easier to do it. But you know, we are uh, struggling here to get intensive care units for the country and, and trying to get uh, uh, diagnostic kits and things like that. I don't, I, I hard, hardly see how could we help anybody else we don't have even for us. Just, just said in two, uh, from Zika, outbreak, I think that uh, now two new things I, I can identify. One is that uh, uh, is the support of companies and philanthropy to, to research that is not very, was not very common in Brazil. And the second is really the movement of data sharing that is expanding much more for a, clinical data or other kind of data, I think that this is also something that in, in some way the, the society and uh, also the scientific community is engaged much more in this outbreak than before. Wow, I think, um, unfortunately we're at the top of the hour um, and I think if there's possibly no better way to, to wrap this up than um, advocating for data sharing <laughs> and information sharing. Um, so, yeah, we probably should have scheduled this for two or three hours, I think. But thank you. Thank you all so much uh, from me personally. It's just wonderful to have you as collaborators and partners um, in the work that we do. Um, and on behalf of the Global Health Initiative and the Latinx community, uh, just thank you for sharing sharing your perspective with us. Um, I think we have a long road ahead. I, I you know, um, I guess I'd, I'd be happy to have that as an excuse to bring the conversation back together again, maybe in a few months and see where we are um, and ask many of the, the questions we didn't get to today. Um, so thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We're continuing the series next week with um, a deep dive on uh, on health disparities um, related to COVID-19 in the Boston area, so closer to home um, next time. Um, and we actually have a subsequent um, look at, uh, at our Latin American uh, um, communities um, with Mexico uh, in, I think, early July. But more about that coming soon, so stay tuned. Thanks again to our panelists for sharing your time and experience with us. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, everybody.